Hi, everyone. So I took this picture last year at the MIT Museum. It's a mind-blowing machine designed by the one and only Claude Shannon. So the machine uses electric and mechanical switches to solve for the final moves of chess. And the name, called Endgame, cannot be more fitting because at that time, the world's top scientists thought that solving chess is the end game to AI itself. And then in the next 70 years, Shannon got way more than his wildest dreams. In fact, we beat chess 40 years ago. We solved Go, Dota, Poker 10 years ago. And recently, we won a gold medal and got a Nobel Prize for protein folding. We have made our parents incredibly proud. And our AI is on track to basically master anything that can be reduced to a sequence of strings. So now what's left to do? What more glory to capture? Well, here's something that your parents are not proud of. <laughs> you host a hackathon party on the weekends, and you completely wreck the house. And you leave for work on Monday, but you come home to a clean house and a candlelit dinner. And yet you couldn't tell if a human or robot had been there. And that is the physical Turing test. It is so mundane, so deceptively simple, yet it involves tasks you take for granted in a messy, unpredictable, physical world. But I would argue that it's the next, or perhaps the last grand challenge in AI. So how's our state-of-the-art robots doing so far? Well, many people worry that our robots are rising up against us. Well, I think humanity is fine. No thanks. We're fine. You guys are all safe for a while. And this soccer game gives me a lot of anxiety. I call it multi-agent panic attack. So why is robotics so hard? Well, a certain great man said that LOMs are running out of data that the internet is the fossil fuel of AI. And I say, you LOM researchers are just so spoiled. You have no idea how much robots are suffering. Look at a typical robot data that we collect at NVIDIA uh, headquarters. So this is from the egocentric camera of the robot. And this is the motor control data that we capture. Does it look like something you can scrape from Wikipedia? No, it cannot be found in the fossil fuel. And that makes robotics so hard. So how do we solve this grand challenge of AI? Ultimately, it boils down to two things, the data strategy and the model strategy. And let's talk about the data first. So how we capture data is through a method that we call teleoperation, where the operator can wear a VR glass and is streaming the hand pose in real time to the robot. And then you can control the robot to do all kinds of tasks, right? like kind of um, putting the honey on the toast. Um, and on the, on the right hand side, that's the egocentric view of the robot. And then you quickly hit the physical limit. right? It is the 24 hours per robot per day that we cannot exceed. And actually, the reality is much worse. It's more like four hours, because the robots break. right? They throw tantrum all the time. You babysit them. So if the robot god is merciful on that day, you get four hours. And if we put the data on this pyramid view, the human data, or really the human fuel, is on top. It's the highest quality, but it's the smallest quantity. And you can do at most 24 hours. We still need the fossil fuel, because they would provide all the vision and language, right, all those understanding. And those are around exabytes per day in unstructured strings of bytes. So can we do better? What's the next frontier of data for robotics? That will be the synthetic data. I'm calling that the nuclear fuel, because it's infinite in principle, but it's hard to use. It's limited by PhD brain cycles. We need to come up with new methods to generate synthetic data effectively, and also limited by GPUs, because you need to trade, compute for synthetic data. So the more you buy, the more you save. <laughs> this message has been approved by my boss. <laughs> How to build the nuclear reactor for robotics. This is Eureka, 
a technique that allows us to train high degree of freedom, dexterous hands, to do pen spinning at human level. And I have to admit, I'm a subpar human. I can never really do pen spinning since my childhood. So I have given that up, but it's great to see my AI avenging my poor skills. So how do we train these? How do we get the data? The answer is there is no supervised data sets. It's all done by reinforcement learning in massively parallel simulations on the GPU, because luckily, physical equations are mostly just matrix multiplications. So what you see here is Isaac Lab running on CUDA, and it's simulating reality at 10,000 times faster than real time. Now, how do we transfer something training simulation to real? We employ a technique called domain randomization, where for the 10,000 environments running in parallel, you will vary their physical parameters, like gravity, friction, and weights, um, slightly across the different uh, environments. And then we invoke the simulation principle. Suppose an AI model is able to master one million realities with different physical parameters, then it's highly likely to zero-shot generalize to the one million and first reality, which happens to be our own physical world. In other words, you make it so that our world is in distribution of your simulation. So by the simulation principle, we can build digital twins of robot dogs that we run in sim and generalize to real, and you can also do uh, these kind of finger manipulation. And this is the most interesting one. So we instantiated this yoga ball in Isaac Lab, but actually yoga ball is bouncy, it's kind of complicated. And we didn't even simulate that. We just do domain randomization on a rigid ball, and then we transfer that zero shot to the world. You know, we're roboticists, we're weird, so we just run it in the streets. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like the director of a Black Mirror episode. <laughs> so my friend actually told me that he saw this work, and then he tried a yoga ball on his own dog, and the dog couldn't do it. So I can at least claim that our method is super dog performance. And then we can scale this up, the same technique. We can scale up to much more complex embodiments like the humanoid. We instantiate an army of humanoids in SIM, and they are going through 10 years worth of intense training in only two hours of war clock simulation time. And of course, we can transfer that to the real world. So in SIM, we trained a three million parameter foundation model. No, it's three million, not billion. Three million parameters to control the humanoid body to stay balanced, walk, run, jump, and dance. And this small neural network captures the subconscious motor coordination that we humans do all the time at millisecond scale, and we run it on board on the Jetson Orange GPU. So this is shot at NVIDIA headquarters, the Voyager building. So when you visit us, you might run into these little guests just running in the hallway of our headquarters. Don't be a stranger wave, say hi to them, and also remember to visit our robot hospital. <laughs> These little guys work as hard as our researchers, but um, no robot harm during filming. So if we put the synthetic data generation methods on this map, here the x-axis is the diversity of the data generated, and y-axis is the speed at which the method produces data. What we just saw is what we call simulation 1.0. It's still the classical physics engine, but running on GPU to accelerate to up to a million frames per second. And we call it digital twin because artists and engineers will build a one-to-one -one replica of the world and the objects in simulation. So it's very effective, as you can see, but it's still a very manual process. And can we do better? Of course we can. We have text-to-3D models that can generate 3D assets, as many as you want. We have diffusion models that can vary the textures of this kitchen. And then you can kind of compose and combine these to generate infinite variations. So we introduce RoboCasa, a large-scale simulation of everyday tasks. And it's able to procedurally generate different kitchens and tasks through LOM guidance, through AI-generated environment textures. And it supports all kinds of different robots. And now, in this kind of procedural generation, let's say you do teleoperation, but this time you don't operate a real robot. Instead, you collect one demonstration 
in simulation. And then you can replay that back in simulation using omniverse rendering. You can have these high quality visual variations of that same trajectory. And through a method called Groot Mimic, it can also augment the actions, the motions themselves. So putting this together, you start from one human demonstration. And through environment generation, you multiply that to n. And through motion generation, n times m. And I promise you, don't fall asleep. This is the only math we're going to do today. <laughs> and here, column one and three of this video are real teleoperation data that we collected in-house. And column two and four are actually these procedurally generated simulation. And you can still tell the difference, but they are kind of very close in spirit. So this is simulation 1.5, generative physics engine. They are similar, but not exactly the same replica as the world. So we call them digital cousins. Now look at this scene. It's got soft body, fluid, translucent glass, complicated full parts. How do you implement and simulate this in Isaac Lab? It's going to take artists a very long time. And if we look back in history, it takes the gaming and the graphics community 30 years to go from the pixelated game on the left to a photorealistic race car on the right. And it takes the video generation community only two years to go from something on the left to something on the right. It's still hilarious, but now at least it's physically accurate. And it, this is the power of data-driven methods. That's what happens if you scale with data. If you recall, at the beginning, I showed this uh, demo that we captured at the, at the headquarters. I lied. There is not a real pixel in this. It's actually generated by a method called Good Dreams. And how it works is you take a pre-trained video generation model, and you fine-tune it on the robot data. And we found that the video model is so good that it can actually learn the dynamics and mechatronics of the robot. And once you have that, you can prompt it in different ways. So here, the left and right hand side are the same. It starts from the same initial frame. And the only difference is the language instruction. So on the left is pick up apple and place on the pan. And on the right is pick up the can and place on the pan. And the video generation model is able to simulate the counterfactual futures. And because it's a video model, it does not care about the complexity of the scene. It's just a bunch of pixels. So this is a more complicated scene, and then it's able to just simulate as well. And you can scale this to a lot more different scenes. Look at the lighting, the reflection, the object mechanics. The video model is able to get most of them right, not perfectly, but um, it's, it's getting there. And we can use Groot Dreams, this technique, to generate millions of what we call neural trajectories to augment the data. I like to think of video world models as Dr. Strange. They have seen almost every possible physical phenomenon from billions of internet videos. The model learns essentially a superposition of the visual reality. And your prompting collapses the infinite possibilities into one chosen future. And that is simulation 2.0, the neural physics engine. They're soft, they're learned, programmed by internet videos instead of graphics engineers. So I call them digital nomads wandering through the latent space of a video diffusion model. So now we have talked about all these methods. Which one do you pick? What's the best? Well, I said that roboticists are not like LM researchers. We cannot be picky about the data. So really, it is a synthetic data integral that you capture a combination of the data under all these methods to squeeze out the performance. And once you combine these data, we use a very, very simple technique called co-training, essentially just sample from these data at different ratios. And we show that, unsurprisingly, adding all of these synthetic data yields a massive improvement. I'm towards the end of my talk, yet I haven't even talked about the model. And that is intentional. If you take anything away from today's talk, just four words, data maximalist and model minimalist. The data can be as complex as you want, but a model should be a clean and elegant artifact that compresses from all those complicated data. 
And this is essentially our model. It goes directly from photon to actions in this end-to-end -end setting. Here is the system two part of the model. It does slow, deliberate reasoning. It understands uh, the visual scene and the language. And it just so happens that diffusion models that generate images are actually really good at generating continuous high dimensional vectors in general. So we use a diffusion transformer to render the motor actions at more than 100 hertz and execute on the robot. And putting this together, this is the Groot N1 model. And it's also cross embodiment just by putting more adapters on top of the DIT. And it's only a 3 billion parameter clean artifact from all the complex data pipelines I mentioned. So let's see it in action. I see that Groot model can be romantic sometimes. And uh, we're teaching the robot now to clean up the champagne it spilled during debugging. And here the task is to retrieve uh, the healthiest snack. And the VOM side, the Cosmos reason backbone for the model will reason that the apple is the healthiest snack and then it would instruct the model to execute the pickup motion and come back to the researchers. And we open source everything. So our Groot model is trained and deployed on PyTorch. And um, this is uh, open sourcing is our initiative to democratize physical AI. So what's next? I argue that in the medium term future, we'll see a transition from physical AI to physical API. Throughout human history, most of the time, it's the human labor that transforms the world of atoms into something useful that supports our civilization. And then over time, the physical API will take over to become the programmatic interface to move chunks of atoms to improve our civilization. And once we have that, you can bring all the familiar concepts back, but now this time on robotics. You can have physical prompting techniques, embodied MCPs, and agentic fleet that coordinates lots of robots to do a task. And then we can build programmable factories. Anything you would like, you will scale up the manufacturing overnight. And self-driving wet labs to accelerate scientific discoveries. And finally, the physical skill economy, the ultimate app store where anyone can access and enjoy the sum of all human dexterity. And I believe all of this will happen no later than 2040. And on that day, you come home from work. And instead of folding laundry or scrubbing dishes, you sit down to a candlelit dinner with a partner, your kids, your parents, and the robots will just fade away into the background ambience. And everything is so mundane that you wouldn't even notice. And that's only 2040. In a blink of an eye, in a blink of an eye we will get there. We were born too late to explore the Earth and too early to travel the galaxies. But I believe we are born just in time to solve the physical Turing test. And we're scaling up hiring as we're scaling up training on PyTorch. So if you're interested, email me, contact us, join us on the journey to the moon. Thanks.